the slides, pardon the fact that they're so quick, when, for those of you who were, weren't here last night, and pardon the fact that they're not quick enough for those of you who were here last night. <laughs> this is the book which I tend to summarize of life's work, come up with a, a kind of an operational manual, a way, a way to think about creating change, and then hopefully to inspire um, the uh, a large scale movement of getting particularly a lot of young people involved. That, that's, my, that's my dream. The, uh, the young people's movement um, is going to need uh, a lot of inspirational direction. Of course, permaculture provides so much of it. But um, that's the sort of story I would like to unfold. I'm reminded. There was a book published in 1947, and it was called The San Candy Almanac, and it was published, the author was Aldo Leopold. And ironically, in 1947 and a few years after, over a million people read that book, and out of that, so many things like the Audubon Society, Sierra Club, you just named it, was a, a plethora of institutional and organizational response. That beautiful book, San County Almanac, with so much power. Now maybe in the electronic age that can't be duplicated in the way it was beginning in 1947. But I, I would love it if, if Healing Earth could at least move us a little bit toward that direction. We talked about the emergency of a ecological technology and focus on this terrible toxic site in a small New England community and the need to find a technology that could treat these chemicals and that could treat them in a way that communities could consider and afford. And it was a huge challenge and the design work went right back to first principles and, uh, and the idea at that experiment was to create, in a sense, a living technology which had all of the attributes of the Earth systems themselves. That exciting challenge. And so you see that we focused on solar energy as the engine for healing the planet. And hence you see those clear-sided tanks where in three dimensions light enters and provides the, the energy fuel for diverse life. Then we talked about only working with all the kingdoms of life. And we saw that when you combine them from different environments, that they could produce these completely new kinds of ecosystems which took those 15 toxic chemicals that are deadly or carcinogenic uh, and broke them down and in the end created a pure water 10 days later. What we didn't talk about was that this experiment Nobody believed. They thought that I was somehow being dishonest. Mm -hmm. And the water was too clean. It was, the toxins were gone, uh, except for one, which was 99.99% removed, almost down to below detectable limits. And uh, it created a lot of suspicion. I was actually fined by the state of Massachusetts. Uh, the reason is I was on the front page of the Boston Globe as a scoff law. It was a high point in my life. <laughs> God. And, uh, and uh, things went really very badly for me. And then uh, the head of the US EPA in Washington 
heard about Story and sent up his technical people to review what I had done. And um, they said, no, this is bona fide, mm. what he's done. And uh, which was a little embarrassing to the state because they were committed to another outcome. Mm. And uh, then the, the US EPA gave me the first Chico Mendez Memorial Award mm. for the rubber tapper and to honor the rubber tapper and the, the uh, Brazilian who was murdered by doing his job of organizing the rubber tappers. So anyway, um, eventually we made a full scale year round facility to prove that it could even work uh, in more well, you're around. And, uh, and in the end it did, but it cost a lot of money to uh, get to the point where it was an acceptable technology. Then we went on to look at, at um, cold climate ecological engineering to treat sewage in Burlington, Vermont. And uh, the prejudice at that time was that these ecological systems are wonderful, but they're no good in the winter because we all know nature goes to sleep or slows down. And uh, in actual fact, it, it worked year round. And the reason why it worked was because we were designing the intelligence of the seasons into the ecology itself, including making sure that winter dominant species were in it in the winter and summer dominant species were inside the system in the summer. And it was an amazing breakthrough. Uh, again, it was funded by the EPA this time. And, uh, and there's the drawing of the um, uh, greenhouse system, which all this happened. And it was, um, it uh, uh, ran the, the full five years of the demonstration project to um, show beyond the sh shadow of doubt that we can work with nature in more northern climates. And then this structure, which uh, uh, John Ta Jonathan was very deeply involved in, was the first building to be awarded the Living Building Challenge, which is the, the next thing above you know, Leeds to, uh, to honor structures and buildings and projects that are completely um, uh, linked uh, to the natural world in, in wonderful ways. And this facility was, besides being a school, um, it was also the waste treatment facility for uh, 55,000 gallons a day of, of uh, sewage on the Omega campus. Um, the exciting part about this is that it really did attract attention. I think its location just north of New York City in Rhinebeck, uh, didn't hurt the project. People could come from all over the world. And also the, the director of the Omega Institute, Skip Backus, is just one of these incredible human beings who, uh, who is committed to, to uh, um, change on a, on a rather large, particularly on an educational level. Um, we worked in many different places. This is a, a uh, uh, city in Fuzhou, in South China, and it had 80 kilometers of canals, which were basically used as um, sewage depositories. So you can see what they're like. They're foul, each building. There was no sewage treatment, as the city just grew too quickly, and it didn't catch up with it. Um, so the idea was to find a, a canal-based technology which would function like an eco machine. And there it is under construction, and there it is completed. Um, it, uh, the, it immediately began to show positive results in the canal, and after about six to eight months, somewhere in there, it, it actually came into compliance with the Chinese EPA. Uh, which was pretty remarkable considering that the wastewater um, was entering the full length of the treatment facility. It was like 
you know, running uphill on the edge. Um, that'll give you a, a look that of these technologies. There's so much underwater. And one of the lovely things about what is underwater <coughs> is that plants have roots, and roots have root hairs. And the surface area is almost unimaginable. Um, one scientist calculated that, uh, that some plants can, can have more surface area for you know, square meter than anything that can be engineered today by an order of magnitude. And uh, so the plant design is a marvelous substrate for treatment. And there are also, as you can see there, is some uh, um, uh, non-woven fabric me media where there is uh, where um, under the walkway because there's no place for plants to be in that particular section. You can see it there and there. And um, I mentioned, I think, very briefly last night that I'm now involved in the preliminary design of a kilometer uh, plus uh, uh, floating restorer technology for uh, the, the city of Den Bosch in southern Holland for their canals. Mm -hmm. in, uh, for in increasing the quality of the, um, the uh, river quality. And the reason they want to do that, the Dutch are very ingenious. They went back this whole area where three rivers come together. And, uh, and imagine what it was like when it was wild. Mm -hmm. And then they imagined what it's like now. And then they looked at the idea of what about reintroducing the wild, like the sturgeon and the salmon, and what would it take? In other words, they used the iconic, they're using the iconic as the, as the basis for design. So the goal isn't just cleaner water, the goal is sturgeon and salmon and other things, including uh, beaver, uh, into their ecology. Even though it's highly urban, they feel that the opportunities are here. And I'm helping them with this work, and it's very exciting. Um, I also mentioned, uh, this back up here, the birthplace of the Industrial Revolution in North America, the Blackstone River between Worcester and Providence, Rhode Island, and how it had been so destroyed by the factories, which were about one every mile, uh, converted to uh, bunker crude oil as a way of powering the machinery that ran the factories. And then after they after the Second World War, and they began to stop the fact that under the ground were these huge tanks still filled with bunker crude oil, and, uh, and uh, the tanks themselves were starting to crack and crumble, and there was no legal ownership anymore. These companies had really gone south, and uh, so they had an uh, environmental disaster on their hands, and we set out um, to um, try and alter that equation. Uh, and basically, we set as our goal uh, um, a dramatically reduced per unit length of treatment over dredging or other solutions. In other words, we were very cost design effective from the very beginning. And uh, this is a system which we won't talk about. It's basically four technologies that were integrated, uh, two of them in a greenhouse, one in the bottom of the canal, and uh, the other floating on the surface of the canal. And, uh, and uh, um, found that the, the second stage in the treatment process was the trickling of oil-contaminated water over, over uh, mycelia from uh, uh, polypore mushrooms or tree, tree rot fungi. And uh, they have the ability to, to begin the process of creating enzymes that begin to crack these large molecules apart. 
And then from there it went to the tanks you're now familiar with, the solar aquatic tanks with a great amount of diversity. And, uh, and uh, after a, you know, five days or so in those tanks, the, uh, the oil in the water was reduced uh, over 95%. Um, and then from there it was pumped out onto the river and began to do the final stages of treatment on and through the floating restore complex, which you see there. Um, this story now is getting interesting. We're, we're currently seriously fundraising to try to develop a project to clean up the whole 84 miles of the river and the canals and to make it a artery for, uh, for basically um, um, travel on foot and on bicycle the length of the river, but mostly on foot. And the, the, uh, the dream is, I, I did mention this last night, of, the, uh, of um, one of the, the key people, uh, Gino Barnett, Barnett uh, is to use the restoration process of the 84 miles to reinvent the next industrial revolution at least in the context of that part of New England. And I like that big blue sky thinking because uh, it's going to, you know, it's obviously going to take hundreds, probably thousands of people working on this project over the next 10 years if we fund it. Um, and, uh, but the, the importance is that we have uh, connected with uh, half a dozen universities who are going to help supply some of the intellectual horsepower um, to make all of this happen and bring in the young engineers and scientists into the, the, uh, the process. So it's very ambitious. Um, goodness knows how successful it will be, but it's it's um, it's important. And uh, uh, the old oh, and I didn't mention it last night, but it's very important. On this site, there are two species of sturgeon that are threatened with extinction. One is the short-known sturgeon, whose range is all the way from the St. John River in New Brunswick to the St. John River in Florida, and it's very close to extinction, and we're going to create a hatchery to start breeding them, and as the river, Blackstone River gets better, the sturgeon require flowing water. And, and in other words, they're a flowing water species, and they, they, their feeding is aided by that. So, uh, and then the other is the, the Atlantic sturgeon, which too is threatened. And, uh, and um, I think, again, the idea of iconic animals and plants and projects kind of provides a, a vibrance of uh, resonance, if you will, for projects. Um, it's, like, it's like mascots on steroids. What's the name of that project? Is it Blackstone River? Project? Blackstone River Corridor. It is a national corridor right now. And, uh, and very, very interesting. Uh, I also talked about um, South Africa and our work in the slums um, and how it's important to for us in South Africa in the slums if it's something physical or tangible it's stolen and so if you put in a water supply system or a wastewater treatment you know all every last valve pump pipe is quickly stolen and sold somewhere. Um, you know, it's what desperate people have to do. So we, we design for these communities uh, uh, invisible technologies. They, they wouldn't know it was an ego machine. And some of them look like uh, one of the most powerful technologies that we've built and tested is, uh, is basically if people look at it, it's a tree and a well. Um, but it's a very powerful 
treatment technology, and uh, and uh, it's it provides people right off the bat protection from the hot sun in the summer and protection from the howling winds in the winter. So it's seen as as something of value only by being in place and not to be sold. Or at least so far, that's how it's worked out. But these rivers are uh, are um, you know are in really bad shape and that's where people get their waters and there's you know whether you're talking about India or Mexico or South Africa or everywhere around the world and so the idea of cleaning up streams is really really <coughs> an important starting point for uh, healing a whole area this this uh, um, drawing here from the book is uh, is three proposed technologies for cleaning up streams. First is an ecological pipeline, and the second is an artificial kelp forest. Um, both of these we've done in other contexts, and they work. And then down at the bottom is an eco-machine restorer, and the idea is you have one of these polluted um, stream, like the one you saw. And alongside it, above, you put an eco-machine, and uh, the the bottom right shows how they're strung together like beads on a string. The familiar story from the very beginning of the talk. And uh, this is the stream restored um, not too far from the city of Stellenbosch, which incidentally is one of the most beautiful cities I've ever seen. And uh, it intercepts river water up above. They come into these systems. And very quickly, the systems start to respond. Um, and this is what they look like. And these are, are the, the um, native species of plants from a, a uh, plant association that I never pronounce correctly, Nancy can, but the Finbos community. Um, and so it's not only exciting to be working with South Africa, Plants, but to see that they are already um, making that water much, much better uh, in terms of pathogens, it's uh, meeting uh, swimming water standards. Um, it's very, very exciting to think that, that we can, with simple little additions using the flow, of course, um, of the river to create the energy and the ecology to, to make better water. Incidentally, this is unfortunate, but this had to be fenced in, uh, as you saw in the prior slide, um, in order to protect the system. Protecting and restoring the seas. Well, um, nobody in Santa Barbara uh, who remembers the oil spill ever gets very far from this, this problem. This is just a slide showing the red dots are where the oceans are in, inshore oceans are in deep trouble. Uh, the yellow dots are where the inshore oceans are on the way to being in deep trouble. And the green dots are where the oceans are actually improving in quality. And as I mentioned last night, the green dots are our source of hope. There are healing powers within natural bodies of water, if they're not too degraded, that can bring them back to health again. And that's good news. So we uh, um, have taken two approaches to the inshore waters. Um, one is to see if there are micro solutions that can, people can do right away to help improve water quality in the coasts. And the other is to find out more larger scale solutions which may allow larger areas to be treated, say like uh, um, the, uh, say the parts of the Gulf of Mexico. Um, this is a harbor, I show this photograph to show you how many um, different how much space is taken up by sailboats and their moorings, or motorboats and their moorings. And um, the 
the rest of the space is usually need for navigation, and you can't go put in technologies like the one in China in a place like this. So we wondered if you could take the moorings that the boats are attached to and uh, create technologies that would allow us to um, um, allow us to remove nutrients from these bodies of water. Lots of little systems. And so we decided to, to study these technologies and develop the eco-technologies that would remove nutrients. And our first attempt to do that was by creating a small um, uh, shrimp farm, tropical shrimp farm in a greenhouse. And, uh, and then look at the different ways that we could, uh, uh, could establish systems within that would clean up water. And uh, then we could apply them on a technical basis on moorings. And this is just one system that does a very good job. It's a floating system, and that's a salt water plant. These are the, the five cells and the technologies of the little farm, which was designed to, to um, work out the uh, technologies. These are the um, communities that we we take these media out into the ocean and they're inoculated and then we bring them back into the greenhouse and study how they, uh, how they purify water and how much they take out. And that is determined by how many shrimp who are producing this is are the source of the pollution. And there is the uh, artist rendering of five of the little restorers on the chain. Um, we, we uh, from our basis with the little shrimp farm, we, we know they're going to be effective. Uh, what we don't know is precisely how effective they're going to be. <coughs> There's a lot of very interesting micro design, and as we more and more design these systems, the more and more they get like complicated marine organisms. It's like, you know, design evolution parallels nature kind of thing. And, uh, and uh, so, this is a technology, uh, the shoreside technology, to determine how many pounds a year of one of these little technologies will remove. And we haven't completed this study yet, but we hope to very, you know, fairly soon. And uh, if we can say, you know, each mooring is is removing 200 or 300 or 400 pounds of nitrogen and phosphorus a year, people have got to go there because we can virtually have our cake and eat it too. We can have our boats, we can have even the spills, usually when people start their engines, it's pretty lucky for a few minutes, so on. And uh, just more variations on the theme, part of the design process. Um, and then the other approach that we took, um, uh, really inspired by number of our projects um, was um, um, bigger systems, systems that would treat millions of gallons a day. And uh, um, we, uh, well, I have to confess something here. I'm um, the, uh, the, I'm always soul of a farmer and the heart of a fisherman. So I'm always trying to do, grow and deal with the sea. And uh, um, we came up with an idea of an ocean restorer. This is a big catamaran. And between its hulls were these four technologies uh, that we had, in fact, experience developing. As you've seen the elbow turfs, you've seen the, the uh, oyster reef, and so on. And um, the idea was to create these a big, a fairly sizable small ship, 135 feet long, and catamaran, and between the hulls to put these things. And then, as the thinking evolved, we decided the moment we want to move these technologies out of the water, above the water line, <coughs> and use spray technologies to uh, to spray on these environments rather than have them submerged. 
so that um, we, they, they function more like the, the uh, Rocky Coast archival things, but they still have the purifying ability. And that's what we've been working on for the last year or so. And this is the, uh, the Naval Architects, uh, who's from Nova Scotia, uh, rendering you know, what the first uh, couple of ocean uh, restorers would look like. Um, and I mentioned last night that all that accommodation is basically my students saying, you have no right to go off and have all this fun without bringing along a school with you. And so that's what, that's what this represents, and with labs and things like that. And a vessel like this could be at sea almost indefinitely. And, uh, and uh, there is the sort of, the <coughs> underbody now has changed to be, uh, uh, to be more like a, uh, more like an upweller technology. And uh, Jonathan, about 15 years ago, I think, built the first under, uh, upweller technology that I've ever seen. And I have some patents around uh, um, ecological filtering systems so that we know between the two concepts we can, we can treat the water. And the, the idea is to not only for these things to be carbon neutral, the, their sales will be photovoltaic sales. Um, they will be both wind and solar powered. And uh, we're designing backwards to make sure that they are carbon neutral so that we can, um, it won't be a large step for us to move to a stage where we could say to, to you people, um, well, we have one of the restorers uh, uh, over here down on the Tijuana River, uh, but we'd be sure be happy to take uh, 40 or 50 of you to uh, Argentina to the uh, permaculture convergence. So that, you know, you're not being the problem getting there in order to find a spot. And, uh, and then eventually uh, move to um, uh, ships which would go to specific places like the convergence, but would also allow you to live and work together to design. Anyway, that's the fantasy. Unfortunately, you said next year. And we, we wouldn't get any sleep if we were to make that schedule. Um, I do want to say that our, our, our hope for, for one of these is that the ship will be, one of them will be in Southern California. Um, Jonathan has a lot of experience on ships and sea. And, um, and it, it will be involved in part with the, the uh, ocean part cleanup of the Tijuana River. That's the plan that, that's in his mind right now. He talked about Appalachia, Appalachia, sorry. The lady went to me, you, you can't throw an Appalachia me uh, at the uh, New York spelling it right. Uh, so, um, a million and a quarter acres that need to be restored not working yet, um, and there we, we, we uh, worked on uh, warm season perennial grasses, uh, charcoal, our muscular fungi, put the combinations together and were able to demonstrate that there are certain plants, if they aided with the right ecologies, that can establish themselves in these horrid environments that begin to make soil again. Uh, this is a whole new area. Most of the efforts in Appalachia earlier were reforesting and that, that while very could work, required a huge amount of importing of, of uh, soil-like materials for the trees. We talked about this might be interesting for us to talk about later, just ecological succession. seen is the diversification of the landscape through ecological processes. And then this is a slide of the institutional succession that's necessary to take, I think it's necessary to take a million and a half acres and convert it to uh, 
a bountiful landscape. It might be fun to talk about that, yeah. Is the mic a little closer? Is, um, th that, no, I'll get right in there. Okay, I'm sorry, and thank you for, for doing that. Um, the reason why I'm backing up is because I'm trying to change the slides, and there's a drawer here that I pulled the drawer out. Maybe I'll just move it this way, see what happens. Yes, thank yeah. you. Okay, so you haven't heard a thing. <laughs> um, and then the Sinai, the climate crucible. It was 10,000 years ago when it was forested, it brought it, the rains to Northern Africa, the Eastern Mediterranean, and east to as far as India brought in the monsoons. Now it's the opposite. It drives the monsoons away and uh, it's, it's deforested. It's a classic example of what is a, a constructive landscape becoming a destructive landscape. And the dream is to re-green the Sinai. And this is, um, um, some of you met John Liu, who is part of that whole process. and. Uh, Wonderful man. And uh, so the problem, there's a Dutch group called the Weather Makers, of which I'm a part. And they, they, uh, they, um, they are organizing politically with the various governments, including the Egyptian government, to do the regreening. But they had no hard evidence that such a process was possible. And yet, they turn to the subject of John Liu's film, Green Gold, to the Los Plateau in China, um, which was um, a source of bad air throughout much of China because the, during the winds, this fine sediments would get into the atmosphere. And the Chinese, beginning 20 years ago, said they were going to change it, and they did. So that's what you see today. And, uh, and um, they, they had, the Chinese used extraordinary resources to do it. There won't be those kinds of resources in the Sinai, but there will be all the ingenuity and, and uh, permacultural ideas that you could imagine going on. And I'll just very quickly show the slides of uh, my little technological contribution to the process. Um, the, uh, this is a geodesic dome, and uh, it, uh, it's a greenhouse. And uh, its vents are open during the day and closed at night. And there is a, um, there is a system that we, we built. Um, uh, actually, Bucky Fuller was involved late in his life in this project. And, uh, and, uh, and there it is with its fence open. Then the next thing with this technologist, we're calling it an oasis eco machine. Put seawater inside. And then add to the seawater, uh, there are the tanks, uh, fishes and, and uh, so on. But this system now, which has salt water inside it, uh, when it's open during the day and closed at night, uh, it's a solar still and fresh water condenses over the whole surface, especially the top, but also the sides. And so you come in in the morning and you drum on the side of the structure and it rains for seven or eight minutes. And, uh, and you have the basis of the solar conversion of salt water to fresh water and the use of that within this climate envelope of a, the building of an ecology, that you see here. And, uh, and it's also an economic ecology because it's very important that, that aquaculture be developed in the Eastern Mediterranean and this is projects is gonna be a catalyst for that. There's the dome with the fig tree bearing and the fish tanks underneath. And then after seven or eight years, as the systems get established within the dome, 
um, and their roots get far enough down into zones where there's moderate amounts of moisture all the time, um, you lift the dome off and you go to a second new location. And you can imagine a fleet of these things marching across the desert, leaving an uh, economic landscape behind. And that's the, that's the plant there. Um, so, and a, a complete with this plan is, uh, is um, the idea of educating a whole, a whole generation of young people around restoration. The, when it's closed, the humidity in the air comes from the salt water in the tanks. And uh, it kept, they also the tanks weep fresh water down the sides. You can plant things around their base. And we've, we've done this. Uh, so uh, we know it works. What we don't know is how well it will work in the Sinai and how long it will take before you have to lift off the dome. I'm estimating. Um, so I, um, for those of you who were here last night, I hope it wasn't too onerous to see the images again. And for those of you who weren't, uh, you'll get some idea of the territory that we covered. And right now, um, I don't know that people like to stretch, but Jonathan is going to come up and tell you about his exciting work here in California.